Well, it's a <clears throat> uh, privilege to be with you, uh, just to think that uh, you're going to give me 45 minutes of your time. Uh, that's an honor. I should apologize uh, for my voice and for my sniffles. I'm a bit congested, and even listening to myself, I think, is that my voice? It's just kind of weird. Uh, so with apologies for that. And I get the great honor of going to the New Testament. And we're going to be looking at Jesus. And as the Apostle John said, well, there's so much on offer that if we talked about everything, uh, the world would be full of books. So we're going to have to narrow it down. So I'm going to Matthew 17. And I hope you have a handout. Uh, there's an outline available somewhere. Um, so I've got three, three sections. I'll treat some introductory issues. Then we'll look at uh, Matthew 17. And then lastly, I'll offer some pastoral reflections. <clears throat> so let's begin with Matthew 17. And I will read... Verses 1 through 20, Matthew 17. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here, if you wish. I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified, but Jesus came and touched them. <clears throat> Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The disciples asked him, Why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, <clears throat> Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood he was talking to them about John the Baptist. When they came to the crowd... A man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and said, Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, Because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as, a, as small as a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it shall move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So I move to uh, our first point, some preliminary comments, and I've got five of those. Um, number one, I'm first assuming mostly continuity. That is, Andrew has taken us skillfully into the Psalms, which is, of course, a book full of laments, 
and I'm assuming continuity with what he's given you. To put it negatively, I'm not working with the assumption that lament was for the Old Testament period, but not for the New Testament period. I think there are many who make that assumption either implicitly or explicitly. Doing so maybe on the, on the basis of thinking that lament just displays a lack of faith, or maybe if the fruit of the Spirit is joy, lament just gets excluded. Uh, I think this kind of disjunctive thinking, this kind of uh, uh, separation between the practice of the Old Testament and the practice of the New Testament, I think that reflects more um, stoicism than really a careful biblical theology. Um, how many song books does the Bible give us? One, the Psalms. Okay? This is why you don't need to have one in your New Testament. You've already got a really good one. And, of course, the Old, uh, Old Testament song book is just chock full of laments. So I'm assuming uh, mostly continuity. Number two. For the most part, I'm going to avoid Paul. Now, please don't misunderstand. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, later on, I'm going to ask some of you to tell me why. Uh, uh, it's funny. Uh, please feel free to laugh. Um, um, I, I, I love Paul. Paul is great, he's very cool. Uh, here's what I want to avoid by avoiding Paul. If we find lament in Paul, someone could say, maybe one of you, maybe someone you know, could say, well, you know, Paul, he's not Jesus. He's a man of like fleshliness as we are, and maybe if he lamented, he was actually sinning at the time. He's not perfect, you know. So for that reason, I'm going to avoid Paul for the most part. I think I'll bring him in later. I think maybe during the discussion time or later in the, in the presentation, I will justify Paul by the way of Jesus. Pun intended. <clears throat> Number three. I'm going to avoid the passion narrative. Now at this point you might be saying, do you have anything to say? What's left? I'm going to avoid the passion narrative. Again, there's a, there's a subliminal, there's kind, of a, there's kind of a sneaky thing I'm doing here. I'd be, be a terrible poker player. I'm just telling you right away, I'm being sneaky. Um, certainly the passion narrative seems like a natural place for us to go, especially since we've been prepared for it, talking about personal betrayal in Psalm 55. But... But here's what I want to avoid. We might say, well, if Jesus weeps or voices despair, especially during the last week of his life, it could just be because he's doing something unique, carrying the sin of the world. I'm not going to do that. Therefore, if he laments, okay, that's just something only for him, not for me. So you can see that there's a crazy rationale, but there's a rationale for not going to the passion narrative. On the other hand, I think Gospels are written in part so that we get to know Jesus so we can imitate him. We might come back to that. Number four. Fourth, <clears throat> as Andrew and I say elsewhere, I'm going to be working with three axioms about Jesus. First, Jesus is fully human, so we would expect him to encounter the same emotions we encounter. We expect him to encounter the same pain and suffering we encounter. We expect him to encounter exhaustion, anger, sadness. I'm assuming first Jesus is fully human. I'm assuming also that you assume Jesus is fully human. Number two, I'm assuming Jesus is sinless because if he's not, we're all in deep trouble, right? 2 Corinthians 5, Hebrews 4. Typically, when we talk about Jesus being sinless, we're in a conversation about the atonement. But I think it's important here 
This means that if we encounter Jesus, Jesus being sad, we do. If we encounter him being angry, and we do. If we encounter him in lament, we do. Then these are all sinless sadness, sinless anger, sinless lament. And that's important. And my third axiom about Jesus. To say Jesus is uh, sinless is to make a negative statement. I want to make a positive one. Jesus is continuously virtuous. That is, John 8 tells us that he always pleases his heavenly Father. So the assumption I'm working with is that every emotion, every facial expression, every word, every act, these are all virtuous. Not just sinless, they are virtuous, which means they are certainly worthy of imitation. So in other words, if he laments, we must. <clears throat> Fifth, I'm going to restrict myself to just one verse in Matthew. Matthew 17, 17. I know it, I know it can be done because I have a dear friend who spent um, nine years doing a Ph.D., at Cambridge University on one word in Romans 3.25. So I know it can be done. We've only got 45 minutes. Certainly it can be done. <clears throat> this brings us to section 2. Matthew 17.7. 7. Let's just refresh our memories. What does he say in 17.7? You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. And under this section two, I've got six items. Now, thankfully, I've gotten them all numbered because some of you know that I'm very bad with math. So we're going we're gonna to be okay, so no fear. A review of the context so Jesus and the first rate, three, uh, Peter, Jacob, John, just went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They left the second rate nine in the valley. And uh, while he's up on the Mount of Transfiguration, Luke tells us it's overnight, a dad comes with his epileptic son, wanting to be healed, comes to the second rate nine, and they can't heal him. Your response might be, well, you know, maybe it was a tough case. To which my response is, Matthew 10 has already told us that Jesus gave them power and authority to heal every disease and cast out all demons. Now, he doesn't tell us they were successful, but he tells us in Matthew 10, they have this authority. They fail. So the father brings the report of the failure to Jesus. And this is when we encounter his comment. Number two. Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell about this encounter. But Matthew has a certain way of telling it. He's crafted the reporting of the events to put emphasis on things that are, that are important from his perspective. So reference to the debate between the Pharisees and the scribes has been removed. Doesn't need to have that. Discussion about how the demon will come out and fasting, that's Mark. No, Matthew's chosen not to include that. Instead, the way Matthew tells it to us, all the emphasis falls on the disciples' failure and their lack of faith, which is one of Matthew's themes which is one of the things he brings up over and over and over and over and over in his gospel. Faith, or the opposite of it, little faith. Which brings us to number three. Faith is the heart of the matter. Now there's this word, 
Little faith. It occurs six times in one form or another in the New Testament. There's five occurrences of the adjective, uh, little faith, one occurrence of the noun, little faith. Now, I know you weren't expecting to have a lesson in syntax, so I just have to ask you to forgive me for that. But of these six occurrences, five are in Matthew. So little faith, this is a concern of his. So I'm going to ask you to follow me along as we look at Matthew's five occurrences of little faith and see what you pick up on as we go along the way. Our first use, it's Matthew 6.30. Here, little faith is like pagan anxiety over not having enough food or not having enough drink or wondering what in the world you're going to put on. And then what does Jesus do? He gives illustration from flowers. He gives illustration from birds. And then he asks a question. In the first appearance of little faith, Jesus asks a question. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today is alive and then thrown in the oven tomorrow, will he not clothe you of you of little faith? The question anticipates a yes answer. I mean, the whole statement is like, know this for certain. God will clothe you. This is going to be a pattern. The next occurrence of little faith in Matthew 8.26. In the boat, with a storm, and of course Jesus asleep. <laughs> That's comedy in the Gospels. Comedy. Jesus is asleep. For Mark, he even makes it funnier. On a cushion. <laughs> I hope it's waterproof, but anyway. All the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they tell about this incident. Okay? In the boat, in the storm, Jesus asleep. And all three, wow, the twelve are in great fear. So what do they do? They come to the Lord. And they tell them we're perishing. All of them use the same verb. We're dying here. Mark, Luke, Jesus gets up, and the first thing he does is he rebukes the wind. And then he rebukes the disciples, but not in Matthew. In Matthew, they wake him. They say, Lord, we're perishing here. And the first thing he does is he asks them a question. Why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the storm. In other words, they get rebuked while the storm is still raging. Matthew 14. Peter briefly walks on water and then doesn't. Keep in mind, only Matthew tells you this. <laughs> only Matthew has the, this flop of Peter. Not intending the pun of flop as a dive, okay? I'm just saying. Only Matthew has this flop of Peter. And after Peter starts sinking, thankfully, Jesus rescues him. Then what does he do? He asks a question. Why did you doubt you of little faith? Do you mind if I digress for a moment? I'm constantly thinking about this the last few years. Why the omniscient ask questions? You ever wonder that? I'm, I'm, just, I'm thinking there needs to be a book on this. So one of you needs to write it. One of you needs to write this, okay? So, 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 so shall we start in Genesis 3? Adam, where are you? I'm not making that up, right? You've read it, right? Yeah? Should we go to Genesis 4? Cain, why are you angry? And some of you are going to say, God, what do you need a lecture on psychology? You know? We go to Exodus 4, what do we find? Uh, Mo, what's that in your hand? 
Well, God, it's a staff. Shall I give you a lecture on a staff? You know? And it just goes on and on and on, doesn't it? It just goes on. And then, and then if you don't mind me saying so, Jesus has some of the silliest ones. Oh, yes. Do, doesn't he? John 5. There's this man who's been lame for 38 years. Jesus meets him at the pool, and he says, what does Jesus have to say to him? Uh, do you want to get well? <laughs> Peter, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to ask you. Why did you doubt? This, this question needs to ring in your mind as you ask, can I trust Jesus? Why did you doubt? You have little faith. The next occurrence, Matthew 16, 8. After the second feeding of a crowd, that is the feeding of the 4,000, Jesus and the disciples are back in the boat, right? He warns them, hey, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. The disciples, just as thick as you and I are, ponder the comment. They're debating if it's all about their failure to bring the bread in the boat. <clears throat> and then Jesus reproaches their lack of faith by asking a question. Oh, you have little faith. Why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you don't have bread? As a matter of fact, there's five questions in the NIV. He's just hammering them here. Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? I think this is sharp criticism. I take it also to be holy anger. Although, admittedly, Matthew doesn't use the word anger. Now, I've stressed the commonality. This, these implicit rebukes that come by way of a question. The disciples lack faith. And their lack of faith is even more astonishing when you consider other characters in the story who maybe even shouldn't have faith, and they do. The centurion, the centurion who has such faith that's greater than faith in all of Israel. How about the Canaanite woman? If it's for me, by the way, tell him I can't talk. Um, the Canaanite woman who has great faith, and the disciples don't have any. Then finally, we get to our passage. This is the peak. This is the, the mountaintop. This is the climax of Matthew's little faith theme. And the emotion, I think, is really clear. The disciples ask why they couldn't drive out the demon. So Jesus tells them there's a big, big gulf between your faith, between your faith and the faith you ought to have. When he asks, how long? This is number four. Number four. Jesus twice asks, how long? This double question strengthens the emotion and the, and the force of it. Okay, to ask it twice. And this is lament language, okay? So he asks, how long? You don't answer this by giving chronological information. <laughs> Any more than if you're at the foot of the cross and you hear Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, that he's asking you for theological information. Where does Jesus get the language? You thought of that question? Where does Jesus get the language that he would say here how long? I take it that first and foremost, I mean, there might be other places where this language comes from. I take it that first and foremost, he gets it from repeated 
hearing of his Old Testament read in the synagogue. It's the common language of lament in your Old Testament. This phrase, how long, uh, Masoretic text, the Hebrew text, constructs it a couple of different ways. The Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, constructs it a couple of different ways. But we've got some 60 to 62 examples of this phrase, how long, in our Old Testament, if we're searching, say, the ESV or the NIV. Let me just look at a couple of um, representative samples of this, of this phrase. So it's used by psalmists, obviously, okay? Psalm 6, verse 3. My soul is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? Psalm 37, verse 17. How long, O Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. Psalm 80, verse 4. O Lord, God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? So the psalmists. This expression also occurs in the prophets and the mouth of leaders. Joshua, Joshua 18.3, Joshua said to the people, how long will you put off going in to take possession of the land, the land which the Lord your God has given you? 1 Samuel 1, verse 14, I think wrongly, the priest Eli says to Hannah, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. Habakkuk 1, 2. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you do not save? And then lastly, this question, how long, appears on the mouth of God himself. Exodus 10, 3. Numbers 14, 11. We'll come back to Numbers 14, 11 really quick. Eklund in her book on the laments in the New Testament, Jesus and laments in the New Testament, uh, gives several other examples. I won't go into those just now. Uh, Let's come back to Numbers 14. Numbers 14. Have you read Numbers lately? You know, there's some really good stuff there. I know there's other parts that are hard that you have to get through, but wow. Numbers 14, 11. The people rebel. They grumble yet again. Okay? And then we come to... Let's start at fourteen ten. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting... To all the Israelites, the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs I have performed among them? Hmm? Hmm? Wow. Just as the Lord here asks two how long questions, so does Jesus. Just as the Lord here says he's given signs, he's demonstrated his capabilities, so has Jesus. Stilling the storm, feeding people. In both instances, Matthew 17, Luke 14, we've got hearers rebuked for the lack of faith. In both instances, it looks like the Lord, Numbers 14, Matthew 17, has reached the limit of his patience. He won't take any more. So this cry, how long? Number five. Or at least on my, on my outline, we're on number five. Do you have a number five? Okay, good. Now we feel much better. There are other connections with the Old Testament. 
Um, and as a matter of fact, I'm not going to go into the other connections of the Old Testament. I think our time would be better used going somewhere else. So I'm going to skip number five. And uh, you can rebuke me later. Um, and move to number six. The emotions of the language. This requires some speculation, but I'm going to do it. I think the narrative helps us see in a concrete way, even though Matthew doesn't use an emotion word, I think what we encounter here is grief and anger. I think we encounter grief and anger. That's what goes along with these words, how long. It's personally painful for Jesus to encounter the disciples' failure after he's repeatedly challenged them, after others who shouldn't believe have believed, after he's given them authority, it hurts. We have grieving anger. And who pays the price for apostolic faithlessness? Who pays the price when the disciples here are faithless? It's the dad. It's the boy who have to wait for healing because the disciples didn't have the faith to do what they had the authority to do. So you encounter the Lord who is not only hurt by, I think, the disciples' lack of faith, he's hurt by the dad having to endure another day of the torment his child goes through. So I take it that this anger, this grief, is informed by love. It's not just anger and grief abstractly by itself. And of course, this anger is a righteous anger. You've heard of B.B. Uh, Warfield writing back, way back, 1912, okay, were your grandparents around at that time? Writing back in 1912, Warfield had this to say. The emotions of indignation and anger belong to the very self-expression of a moral being and cannot be lacking to him in the presence of wrong. We should know accordingly, without instruction, that Jesus, living in the conditions of this earthly life under the curse of sin, could not fail to be the subject of a whole series of angry emotions. So Matthew doesn't have to use the word anger. We know because we've read his whole story. This is the peak, okay? How long just lets us know this frustration. And that brings us to number three. Some pastoral reflections, and I put these into five questions and the questions are largely repeated in the discussion questions that you have on your table. So apologies for that if you end up getting bored with them. By the way, that was a joke. I'm just trying to lighten the mood. Okay. Number one, why do we often assume that there is an incompatibility between lament and anger on the one hand, and trusting God on the other. Now maybe no one told you this, but haven't you sensed that? Haven't you heard it in one way or another? Is that there's got to be some sort of incompatibility between anger on the one hand and trusting God on the other. Nicholas Voltersdorf, in his, in his article, If God is Sovereign, Why Lament?, has addressed this. And I won't repeat what he said. I'll just repeat what I've said with apologies. First, Jesus always trusts his heavenly father. 
I assume that's beyond dispute in this room. Second, Jesus got angry and lamented. This is the only thing up for dispute. But if you accept number two, then number three follows. Okay? No, there's not an incompatibility. No, no necessary incompatibility between anger, lament, and trust. They can both exist. I know there are times when our anger can go bad, real bad, real fast. I don't doubt that. Um, just keep in mind, of course, that our love can go bad real fast. And our joy can go bad real fast. There are times when we take joy in things we ought not to take joy in. So why do we see such a disjunction? Question two. <clears throat> For those of you who are leaders, I'm pretty sure that's almost everybody out, uh, out there. Are you allowed to voice your lament and frustration and disappointment in the hearing of the people who have disappointed you? Or is there some eternal unwritten Torah that says, no way, don't do it? To whom is Jesus speaking when he says, unbelieving generation, how much longer am I going to put up with you? He's not speaking into the air, okay? It's the, it's the disciples who themselves should be obedient, but they're acting like the nation as a whole. And keep in mind, of course, that uh, they've just come down from the Mount of Transfiguration. And who was there? Moses and Elijah. And of course, their ministries were just pain-free. What does Moses... Think of it, think of it this way. Think of it this way. Uh, Moses writes a book. And he passes it to the people of God. And the book chronicles his frustration with them. Doesn't it? Okay. Is that pastorally unwise? I recall some uh, 20 years ago, I went to a pastor's conference. I won't give any indication where. Uh, it was fun. And uh, we had a speaker, several, several speakers. And one of the speakers uh, is, was, famous, uh, celebrity, book writer on the radio, big church, um, and, and spoke and then had Q&A with us. Most of that was good. And then, at one point in the conversation afterwards, the pastor told us in no uncertain terms that you as pastors must never, ever let your congregation know you are discouraged. Why? Why? Well, I think uh, that's uh, ministry informed more by Stoic philosophy than the Bible. Number three. Are your people allowed to lament? Your parishioners, your spouses, your roommates, your co-workers, your children, your parents, perhaps even your pastors. And can you listen? What will you do when you listen? <laughs> how, how, will you be, how will you be listening? How will you be, how will you be engaged? It's, uh, I think on the one hand, it's the general thought that lamenting is okay. Expressing grief is fine as long as it's individual, in private. Maybe when you talk to someone at church, perhaps. But of course, this will never become something the community does as a whole. But let me just, let me just finish point number three by, by uh, modifying Matthew 25. Modifying Matthew 25. 
You know the parable of the sheep and the goats, right? So I cut in later in Matthew 25. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or, or, or thirsty and give you drink? Uh, when did we see you a stranger and welcome you? Or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? When did we hear your lament and lament with you? And the king will answer and truly and say to them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. Jesus laments in Matthew 17. Are you willing to listen to his? Then you've got to listen to your brothers and sisters too. Number four. What does Matthew 17, 7 tell you about Jesus, the high priest, a high priest able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses? One tempted in every respect as we are, yet without sin. What does it tell you? <laughs> it tells you that the frustrations in life are frustrations in life. You can express that. I'm going to move quickly to question five. Does knowledge of the future remove pain in the present? Does omniscient knowledge of the future remove pain in the present? Does Romans 8.28 remove pain in the present? If you have pain in the present, if you grieve in the present, if you're angry in the present, if you have sorrow in the present, does this mean you're not, not believing Romans 8.28? Because after all, your future is secure. Your future is going to be glorious. Your future is going to be fantastic. So since your future is fantastic, how dare you have any kind of negative emotion in the present? It's all secured. But of course, you see, this is, uh, this is not Jesus. Many, many people think this. That knowledge of the future removes pain in the present. And not just lay people, not just you and me. Um, Christopher Tuckett, New Testament uh, scholar, says this. A Jesus who already formulated some ideas about a positive meaning of the cross. A Jesus who knew already prior to his death that the death would surely be reversed by resurrection, and who perhaps claimed a uniqueness beyond that of the normal mortal, would be a Jesus for whom the agony of Gethsemane and the cry of dereliction would be a sham. Oh, my time is up. Did y'all hear that? My time is up. That's convenient because I'm at the end. <laughs> so now we move into, uh, we, oh, y- y'all are going to talk. And then maybe later we'll come back and uh, we'll take some Q&A.